there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right in a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Welcome, everybody, to the Must Read Alaska show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska, as usual. I'm in Anchorage once again. I spent a couple of weeks in Southeast Alaska this last um, month and happy to be back in Anchorage. Happy to be back where the wind doesn't blow constantly. And John, my co-host, you're in Nikiski as usual. Uh, you're back from your travels to uh, San Diego. And what's going on in Nikiski and the Kenai? Well, thanks so much, Suzanne. John Quick here out on uh, the Kenai Peninsula. And uh, yes, I've uh, spent last week uh, in San Diego, was at a marketing conference. It was awesome. I uh, learned some new tips and tricks for uh, what we're doing here with Must Read Alaska. And uh, it was exciting. You know, there was one of the things I would say that I saw in San Diego that was different than Anchorage was there's less people wearing masks in San Diego than Anchorage, which was just astounding to me. Um, you know, I thought I was going to get asked for a vaccine passport when I went to restaurants or, um, you know, lots of military there and stuff like that. And even the military folks, I would say 50 to 60% of them were not wearing a mask out and about just, you know, walking around. And so uh, that was uh, definitely a, a good to see, you know, we're kind of living a bubble here in Alaska and, and um, oftentimes you know, think the lower 48 is a bunch of loonies, but uh, turns out that uh, folks in Anchorage are wearing more masks than folks in California. So um, anyways, I, uh, the other thing I think I want to talk about real quickly before we talk, uh, go chat with our guests is that our podcast is now officially on Pandora, which is exciting. Pandora's oh. the kind of the most trickiest pr platform to get your podcast on and and we got approved uh, for their platform a couple of days ago, which is awesome. Our podcast is going nuts. We, uh, this month, we'll have about 20,000, 21,000 downloads. And to put that in perspective, last year, the, the biggest podcast in Alaska had 55,000 downloads for the whole year. And we'll, we'll have 21,000 uh, downloads in just one month. So uh, it's... Uh, you know, thanks to folks like you listening. So thanks so much for putting us at number one on the list in Alaska. That's pretty awesome. Well, we want to thank also um, the Charlie Pierce for Governor campaign for sponsoring the podcast this year. Uh, Charlie Pierce for Governor jumped in a, a month ago and said, would you like a sponsor for your podcast? I said, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of costs to running something like this. So we really appreciate the support. And uh, thank you very much to Charlie Pierce for Governor for your support for this um, endeavor to kind of bring the conservative side of the news to Alaska. Uh, we have the newsletter, of course. Uh, we've got the daily news on mustreadalaska.com. We've got this podcast. So we're trying to reach people wherever they are. And we're so excited today to have somebody on our show that I wanted to talk to for a really long time. And I only run into you, Mark Anthony Cox, at different events where we can just sort of cover the you know, just the top, the top of the things. We just don't really dive deep into to knowing each other that well. But but you're running for school board, and I just wanted to welcome you to our show because we are just a few days away from the end of the um, uh, mail-in election here in Alaska, in Anchorage, and we really want to see you succeed this time. So welcome to, welcome to our show. Thank you so much for having me. As you said, this is long overdue for us to have a nice in-depth conversation. There's it a lot is. going on. <laughs> It is. Yeah. And you're a person who's intrigued me for a long time. Um, I, I want to find out a little bit more about you today. And I want our, our uh, listening audience and our viewers on Facebook to get to know you, because I know you've run for school board once before. And um, this is your second time, I believe. Uh, I, you're taking on the school board president. Is that correct? That is correct. The current yeah. incumbent, Margot Bellamy. Yeah, Margo Bellamy. And this is an election that is uh, voted on citywide. So if, you, if you've got your ballot, folks, you're going to see that uh, you can only vote for an assembly member in your district. But when it comes to that school board seat, 
you can vote for um, uh, you know any of the candidates that are on that on there. So you're going to be uh, you're a citywide candidate. It makes it a more challenging race in some ways because you have to appeal to the city, uh, the entire city. So tell me a little bit about where you grew up. I want I think our people want to hear from you, not from me. Okay. Well, thank you for that PSA. That's the number one question I think all school board members get is, oh, if you're in my district, I'll vote for you. And it's a citywide race. So, you know, everyone will have that opportunity or the equivalent of a mayor's race, as we can all tell. So a little bit more about me. Gosh, where do I start? I was a military, they call it military brat. Um, yep, that's what they call it. And, and uh, my mother and father at the time were both in the military. Uh, we eventually became a single family home and I uh, moved up here right, I think right before turning a teenager. And I went to Bartlett High School first. And uh, that was the first turnaround uh, in regards of culture. I, my parents and uh, did a really good job taking me to the best schools within the nation, wherever we went. So I came from an all boys Catholic military school into Bartlett High School. Whoa. And it was a culture shock. Uh, I think the biggest thing was recognizing people didn't have to wear uniforms. So I was confused because my class, it was, it was used to being a certain color scale, whether it was green or whether it was blue or something. But now it's public school. You have your own options. So I remember the first day of school, I came into it with a suit because that was, that was the only other clothes I had besides that. Nice. So, oh, uh, my goodness. Uh, Walking into Bartlett High School in a suit. Nice. Yeah. Very, oh, very, very big gangster move there. <laughs> so um, the very first thing I did uh, being a child there was uh, join the football team because I was a, a proficient athlete at the time. And um, we later on went and, uh, and got the state championship. So that was a uh, post high school. That's huge, after. actually. That's that's a big deal. Hey, it, it's a team effort. Uh, yeah. sure. And uh, after high school, I wrote self-help books. Um, I felt really, uh, how you say, inspired when it come, when it came to the Title I school culture because I came from, you know, private schools and uh, other uh, entities where, you know, usually people, they either had a dual income slash dual family home and coming into the situation, seeing the pervading issue of single uh, family homes, low income homes, I was like, okay, well, there's something I need to impart even though I was a child then. And so I wrote self-help books and uh, I, I was able to put them back into the schools that I went to, which is Bartlett and Eagle River High School. And that was something that I really looked uh, up to. I also got exposed into politics at the time, uh, District 13 and 14, which was then uh, Chugiak Eagle River. I became a representative and then a chair to uh, see the Republican Party uh, grow, and, grow and flourish at the time of the Obama administration. And so that was my first little dip, but I also got to meet a lot of good mentors, um, people who were proficient in their business, proficient in their family and proficient in politics, who uh, gave me the nudge necessary to continue on, it would seem the family business, which was the military. So I joined the military, went into the medical corps and a very quick turnaround when it came to promotions and whatnot, um, while also having an entrepreneur spirit while in the military. So it would seem impossible, but you know, God provided a way for me. Uh, at the time I met my wife, uh, well, I had met her 10 years prior to, it was uh, what do you call the, the natural chase to finally be able to marry her. And uh, she came from Anchorage, Alaska too. And so once we got married, we were able to get out of the military honorably, uh, came back to Alaska and um, I started going to school again. I didn't think it would be something that I would do. Uh, I was a good student because I came from really good um, education systems. But um, once I got up here, I wasn't really too motivated, but uh, thankfully the military, it, it taught me to once again, reach a little bit higher for your goals. So decided to go for my degree and uh, finishing up my finance degree, did my associates. And uh, now, oh man, I, in the midst of COVID, I did a 501c3 called Family Charity of Alaska. And so I saw the issue firsthand, people with food insecurity. So was able to establish that and be one of the many hands that helped out the community at the time. And man, all the issues that came during that time period, it was it was a busy job. Also got into real estate as a professional and then started a retail business and um, also started a subcontracting business. So with all of that, plus uh, doing urban design commission as a commissioner, as well as uh, 
teaching 12 to 19 year old youth in my church. Uh, even though it sounds like a lot of things, they all kind of have the same string attached. And that string is that my passion is helping people. Uh, my passion mm -hmm. is drawing the best out of people, you know, taking from whatever I consider abundance and giving it to those in need. So whether it be tangible or intangible things, it's 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 a natural, it's intrinsic, it's it's what I like to do. And now here we are in the midst of uh, the Anchorage School Board candidacy, and it's it's all in the same breath. Uh, whether it's helping kids, whether it's helping families, these are the tenets uh, that I stand for in my platform as well. That's Man. awesome. That's awesome. Well, um, Mark Anthony Cox, I love hearing your story. It's inspiring for folks. I think that oftentimes people think that, you know, you have to uh, get into politics in your back nine of your career or life, you know, when you're 60, 70 years old, okay, then it's time to get into politics. But I think seeing somebody like yourself, who's young and ambitious and uh, has an entrepreneurial spirit, I think it sends a different message, which I think is a good message of that. You don't have to wait around to see the change that you're wanting. And so my question to you is this is, what do you think, what do you think the school board could be doing better? I think, um, you know, people want run for a reason and there's definitely, um, sounds like you're a pretty positive guy, but if you had to point to a couple of things that the school board could be doing way better at, what would you say a couple of those things would be? I'm glad you said a couple of those things versus just one. Uh, I don't have to base my answer. Uh, one of the things that stick out the most for me being an, an entrepreneurial type of individual is management. Um, the lack thereof, I can't necessarily fault the board because then the second thing besides management would be board composition. The whole aspect of having a board of directors is a diverse group of perspectives that can look at a problem. And that's why you want a psychologist, an engineer, an oil guy, a business elite, and then as well as an educator. Because when they look at a problem, then we have actual full view of the issue as well as innovative ideas. So the board composition would be another thing. And then uh, lastly, it would be the culture. And I, I, the culture stems, I believe, from those two things, the mismanagement, as well as the board composition because they don't necessarily have a vision that falls in line with what the community would like to see. Because it's one thing to say, we would like to increase proficiency and you go from 36% to 55%. That's still not passing. Well, well, let's be more ambitious and say we would like to see 75% and then build a plan around that. So with that, those are to me the one of the, the many things that are... Uh, at fault right now with the current board. Yeah, can you imagine what our, our our entire city would be like if we had our goals set even at 75% proficiency for our students, but the fact that the board is only hoping to just breach 50% of our students will be proficient in reading and math at their grade level, that that's as, as high as they feel that they can set it. it it's discouraging because that means, um, that means 50% of our students are heading toward basically a really hard life. If they can't, if they can't read at grade level, if they can't um, do math at grade level. I mean, it'd be one thing if you could read at grade level and maybe you're slipped behind in math or, or vice versa, but our scores are so incredibly low in everything. So what a city we would have if even all of our, if we had 75% of our students just at grade level. That would be there's, there's so much, um, there's so many hindrances that keep us from setting, I believe, higher goals. Uh, the hindrances, including curriculum, the hindrances, including, they call it financial constraint, but it's really, as I said in the beginning, mismanagement. And if we were to remove those hindrances, and you know, it's not something we can do in the next day, it's something that we have to strategize for, um, do better at the board composition so that we can have sweeping policy changes and set uh, an actual tangible um, vision for the superintendent to then do. But uh, with these hindrances that we currently have in place, we have teachers who can work around it because you know, 36% proficiency shows that someone is doing their job, someone or someone's, but it's not enough. Uh, it's not, 
it's not doing well for us as it looks for the national stage. Because think about individuals who come with their children. Maybe they aspire to come to Alaska. Well, the first thing they see is that we have the least educated. We are the least educated state, but we spend the most per child. Then we've just attracted individuals who could then help out Alaskan businesses, who could then help out our city. So what we're doing, it's it's creating a bigger problem if we don't fix it. And I believe uh, one vote at a time uh, when it comes to this cycle for myself and uh, Rachel Reese as well, we, we have an opportunity to change the tide because this is how we fight um, the things that we don't like in a democracy, we vote. We get out there, we vote, we tell other people about it too. There, so, there you go. And yeah, go ahead, John. So as you're talking to folks, I'm sure you're talking to parents and folks in the community and you're doing fundraisers and get togethers, what are some of the, you know, one or two biggest concerns that these parents have with the school board and how would you address them as a school board member? Uh, I, I do get a diverse group of people who contact me, whether they have kids or don't have kids, whether they are teachers were teachers or have never been one. And so from each of those categories, I would say from people who are teachers who have been teachers, they remind me over and over of the mismanagement. They remind me of the curriculum constraints that they have. At, at, right now, they're at a point where they're reading from a script to teach our children. They're at a point right now where we as parents wouldn't have our kids in front of a TV all day, but instead we have our children in front of a computer screen all day to teach them. And um, when it comes from a parent's perspective, it's a lack of trust in the current school board and school district when it comes to not only the proficiency, uh, the ability to make our children proficient, but also what they are being taught. There is many questions, there's many uh, discontent parents when it comes to the type of curriculum being taught as well. And it's, it's ironic that it's, it's not the whole district. There's certain schools that pop up um, that I hear over and over again where a majority of many discontent parents are at. And then when it comes from people who don't have children in the system and um, yeah, who don't have children's system either currently or not anymore, it's the tax burden. We're, we're, we constrain our city 62% because as we continue saying yes to bonds, the city has to use its own credit. I think we might have lost them. Are you still there, Suzanne? I'm here, and um, we just had a, a little temporary glitch, but we may have lost. Let me go. Let me go it's see. Just like personal there finances. Is. Oh, there he is. He's back with us. You paused for about yeah. twenty seconds. <laughs> yeah, so that that does happen now and then. We we get these uh, little glitches where it's somebody's internet connection. Where did, what was the last thing you heard? And we'll just go from there. Well, I think you were talking about um, the curriculum and, and you were talking about the 36% and, um, and that's sort of what I heard last. Okay. Uh, yeah, so the curriculum from a teacher's perspective is uh, and the constraints of it is something that they don't enjoy as well as parents. Um, the content of the curriculum, we know critical race theory is a big issue, um, but of course they have another name for it, social emotional learning. And um, when it comes to that, parents are discontent and therefore they have a distrust towards the school district and school board, which is why we're seeing a lot of children go from the school district into the private school uh, sector. And then when it comes to um, the people who don't have children in the system anymore or who never had children in the system, it's the tax burden that we do it. We as a school district, 62% of our city's budget is tied into us because as we continue saying yes to bonds, the city has to make sure that we can do good when it comes to paying those bonds back. And right now, without any new bonds, we're, we're set to continue paying off bonds till 2050. So yes. if we continue saying yes, then we, we're now moving into, if you're a parent now, your grandchildren have to pay those bonds, you're great, great. And we don't want to do that. It, it wouldn't make sense from a personal finance standpoint. So why would we do it as an organization? So those are the, the, the topics that I hear from these uh, type of stakeholders. Yeah. And, and really uh, right now we are paying for, we're, we're paying on bonds for things that in effect don't even exist anymore. We've, we're paying for buildings that 
are um, needing new bonds to repair them again. We haven't even paid for the old ones. We haven't even paid for the old repairs. And yet we've got um, more repairs or expansion. And I, I, I don't know where people stand on these bonds, but I, I typically vote against them because I feel that, um, that it need, I'm, I'm usually sending a message as a voter to the school board that I think that they need to do better with their money and that they're always coming to us for money. They'd say this time, if we vote for this one, they won't come back to us next year for another bond. Um, our city, however, typically the voters will approve the bonds. And then, so our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will be paying for those. We have a, we have a hope. Um, if you've ever had a family member that uh, has borrowed some of money from you, let's say a thousand dollars, and they didn't pay you back, but you saw them at the barbecue again that following year. You treat them nicely, you respect them, you ask them how everything is going, how's the family, but you never loan them more money. So here's yeah. the school district, <laughs> uh, as we said, with the mismanagement aspect of it, I, I would encourage our city to say no to bonds. And I, I know from an emotional perspective, yeah. The reason why you would want to say yes to the bond is because you you hear and you see the way they phrase that the school really needs it. And it's not I'm not saying that the schools don't need it, but much of this deferred maintenance could have been done if we had managed our money wisely. So right now we're, we're at 850 million is the current budget that they're going for for the 22-23 year. But when it comes to that, 85 point something percent right now goes towards salaries and benefits and maybe three percent goes to the school so what does that look like numbers wise so we have 99 schools three percent of 850 million let's say it's uh 28 million uh and therefore not divided by 99 schools each school gets about 290k um, per school now divided by how many students we have, uh, I think it's 42,000 students. So right now it's $636 per student is what we're able to do. And of course, uh, I think uh, people who aren't able to have this conversation in a tactful manner go, well, are you gonna go after salaries and benefits? Uh, the answer is no. The goal is if we manage our transportation system better, the goal is if we manage our supplies and our inventory as well, because these are things that can, I guarantee will pop out uh, more money that has been mismanaged prior to, and then we can utilize that towards enriching the classroom environment. And it's, it's just simple management right there, but for individuals who may have not been uh, in an executive leadership having to deal with uh, payroll and deal with you know projections when it comes to how can we uh, properly scale our business. Right now we're improperly scaled. So the thought of us expanding our services, it, it sounds like a farce because our, our expenses have increased but our revenues have decreased. So it wouldn't make sense for us to continue growing as a school, but that's, that's what school districts do, any educational system, the goal for it is for it to expand its services as much as possible. But right now we are not in the financial state to do that. It's not, uh, it's not that we don't want to give our kids the best education, it's that we haven't already done it K through 12. So why would we increase our ability to further miseducate the public? You know, we're, we're losing our students too. We, as, as you pointed out, some of our students are leaving for private schools and some of them are just leaving with their parents leaving the state. So we've gone from 48,000, 50,000 students down to, I don't know, maybe 42,000 um, at last count. And that's a pretty big drop. And, and yet uh, we, you know, so we should be able to see that teacher student ratio improve I mean, it's supposedly improved, right? We didn't fire any teachers. So we have the same amount of teachers, the same amount of expenses. We should see amazing outcomes this year, but I, I don't have great hopes for that at this point. So we need a little bit of a revolution on the school board and, and your opponent, Margo Bellamy has been sort of leading the charge in the other direction, which is to really focus on social emotional learning or critical race theory. She's been a big proponent of that. I am not a proponent of that. I, I think it's fraught with peril, quite honestly, because it's kind of a you know, tribal warfare type of thing. And I think that's the kind of thing we need to get away from. Um, but uh, and get back to, you know, basic learning and uh, just the, the teaching of the, the basics and let the parents handle the rest. And I know you, you share those values. So for everybody who's just tuning in, this is Mark Anthony Cox. He's running for school board. Your school board seat A, which is right now being held by Marco Bellamy, the who's the president of the school board. And she's also a um, 
a real strong advocate of sort of these uh, equity democratic policies that she keeps pushing. And um, she's quite quite the formidable candidate. She's got a lot of money. She's got a lot of union support. And uh, you're up against a real race. This is a real race for you. How, what are people telling you when you get out there and talk to them and, and do your door to door? It's uh, it's funny. It The transition of comments, at first the comments were, you know, good luck. And now it's when you get there, please don't change. So there's a lot of community support. I, I see pictures of ballots and some of them I do have uh, questions on of their choices, but no matter what the composition of choices are, they continue to choose me for Anchorage School Board C-Day. And it's an, it's an honor um, that so many different types of people, uh, whether their political views are the, the same or very um, dichotomous, are still wanting to put support for Mark Anthony Cox, whether it be for the youth or whether it be for the ideas. When I talk to people, um, of course, I tailor the conversation to the party, but I stay true to myself and my beliefs. So if I'm talking to someone who's uh, very different when it comes to political views instead of biblically conservative like myself, then I speak, uh, or at least I major on the point of the mismanagement aspect. I major on the point of property tax and how it, how school board does deal with you and your family as well. And I, I speak of the proficiency and the hopes that I have for it, because that's something that goes across the aisle. We, 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 when you, when you start getting into the conversation of people's kids or people's money, now we have a personal conversation. We no longer are talking about the weather. We're talking about things that we truly care about. So uh, even though I am going, I, I, and I run my campaign, not against a person, it's ideas. We have different values. And because of that, I, I think people enjoy the added level of respect, even though politics can be the wild west at times. So I speak on policy. I don't just say what, but I also say how. So when it comes to the learning outcomes, uh, schools from the K through three aspect should be able to teach our kids to read because after that, our kids should be able to read in order to learn. So we, we lose a lot of our kids not being able to do that. And I hear firsthand accounts of second graders not even knowing their ABCs in our current Anchorage school district. So there is a high chance that these same kids, when they become disengaged with the learning that's happening in schools, will get into mischief. And so then we also have a crime issue too. And you know, I run a school board race, not a city race, but all these things do correlate. And that's why municipal elections are extremely important. So the goal for us as a school board is to get back to basics. It's not necessarily something new because what we have done for at least the last 20 years is continue getting the new things. I was like, okay, yeah, that's that's old, you know, the Saxon, that's old, you know, all the, the reading program. Let's, let's do something different. And that something different has set us back further than us just maintaining the basics, remembering what we are there for because schools especially the K through 12 environment, my belief is for it to be a foundation builder. Once we have a solid foundation, you have reading, uh, writing, math, and you know, social studies and civics proficiency. Now, when we get you out into the quote unquote real world, you have a base, you have a base where now you can go to the Ivy League school, or you can go to the community college, you can go into vocational programs, you can go uh, into entrepreneurship even and be established and that's yeah. what we need for our children is for them to be established not just exposed or inundated with material but established with an understanding so that they could then be wise in the quote-unquote real world or post-graduation wow. well, I, I think a lot of my friends that are uh, live in Anchorage they think that uh, the school board overstepped their bounds by you know closing down in-person learning and shutting down sports and and making masks required on kindergartners and first graders. Do you think any of that was an overstep? Uh, how and how would you do it? How, how would you have done it any differently or um, uh, possibly influenced it differently? COVID-19 put upon us uh, unprecedented challenges. And with that, we were adopting other states' policies. We were adopting, you know, whatever we could hear. Uh, and by we, I mean the school board and the school district. And there was a time where we were just simply confused. But after confusion had passed, we, we had a resolve. And this is where government makes such an important part is because we're representation. We're public servants. What are we serving? We're serving our public. So it's one thing for... California to do what they want to do in New York for what they want to do. But we as Alaskans have a preference in how we want to learn. 
And this is where we got to have the right government officials in too, so that they can advocate for that. So did they overreach? Yes, because they discounted so much public input, which is essentially our role is to receive that public info, uh, input and advocate for it. And so right now, as we said, the board composition right now is not for individuals like us who conserve the values of family being important, who conserves the values of fiscal conservatism, who conserve the values of smaller government that doesn't overreach. Instead, it's all the way on the opposite side. So they did overreach. And that's one of the biggest lessons I hope for the future board is that we never become so focused on what everyone else is doing that we forget who we are. We're Alaskans. We, we, we are putting in our own blood, sweat, and effort into our children's education, into our city's prosperity, into our state's flourishment. But we need to have representatives who focus on us, <laughs> especially when we take the time to go to these board meetings to let our input be known. Because it's one thing to email a person. It's another thing to send them a letter. It's another thing to be there, though. And many meetings have I seen the massive output of testimonies that come in. But now I'm starting to see it dwindle, actually not so much so because we're, we're really into this wave that's coming, is that we feel discouraged at times and therefore the assembly halls and the school board halls are a dark place to be as opposed to what it's supposed to be is, ah, yes, I get to talk to my representative so they can advocate for my interest in Juno so that they can advocate for my interest in the school district. And that's just not where we're at currently, but I do have a hope with a, a, a sizable change in all of those arenas that um, we can get back to the basics. We can get back to the original intent of what government is. So, so before we go today, would you just help people know how they can get a hold of you, for instance, your website and um, how they can help your campaign if you have a Facebook page and that type of thing? Would you give us that information? Of course. Uh, so I'm Mark Anthony Cox running for Anchorage School Board Seat A. You can reach me at my email, mark.anthony at mac4anc.com. Or you can go to our website, macforanc.com or Mac for Inc. And you can always just reach me at my line, 907-406-4921. And when it comes to Facebook, it's at Vote Mark Anthony Cox and the same for Instagram as well. Uh, we keep uh, lines open because, as I've said before, we're here to serve the public. So public, please engage so that we can continue to advocate for our community's best interest. Thank you well, so much. Yeah, thank you so much. You are really an impressive person. And I, I want to see you in office serving your community um, as, a, as an elected leader in one form or another, because I think you have an awful lot to bring to the table. And I just think that your voice is incredibly important. You are a mission-driven person, and I can really appreciate that. You are here, um, you're the real deal. So uh, before we go, John, is there anything else that you need to impart to our amazing listeners? <laughs> nope, I just uh, wanna encourage you, Mark Anthony Cox, that uh, keep pressing forward, you can, you can make a difference. Um, we saw a difference made here on the Kenai Peninsula Borough. Um, we had a superintendent that refused to listen to conservatives and um, through people showing up to meetings and getting involved and having certain school board people press issues. We got a new superintendent who listens to people and um, change can happen. And you're doing, you're literally uh, practicing what you preach and you're putting your name out there. So um, kudos to you and, and uh, just keep pressing forward and we'll be hoping for the best for you. There Thanks. you go. Yeah, well, if you're a supporter of Best Read Alaska, we really appreciate all the support we get. We appreciate uh, Charlie Pierce for Governor for sponsoring this uh, podcast. Charlie Pierce for Governor came on to sponsor us a, a month ago, and we certainly do appreciate that support. If you'd like to support the conservative side of the news, then the donate button is on the right-hand side of mustreadalaska.com. And John, you're going to have the podcast on Wednesday, so I will see you there. I probably won't be on, but I'll be watching. And until next week, everybody, we're signing off from somewhere in Alaska. Thanks.